Okay, so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to um, welcome to campus for this policy exchange event on uh, bits and billions: the future of high impact digital entrepreneurship in the UK. Uh, I'm Chris Yu. I'm head of the digital government unit at Policy Exchange. I look after our research on public policy as it relates to technology, data, and the internet. Uh, the event today is really just um, to spend a bit of time with all of you discussing um, the conclusions, the findings from our recent work on high impact digital entrepreneurship. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, policy exchange research and our findings. Um, we'll hear some views firsthand from entrepreneurs about the challenges they're facing growing businesses in the UK. Um, and then we've got a fantastic panel of speakers who will share their perspectives. Um, and then I'll open the floor up to take questions from all of you and hopefully we can get a really good uh, conversation about the issues going. Um, we'll aim to wrap up the formal part of today at around about half past three. And we've got the space for a bit longer, so if people want to stay behind, make connections, and talk about some of the issues that have been raised in more detail then, then there'll be plenty of time to do that. Um, and for those of you who are armed with iPads and mobile phones and uh, a Twitter app, the hashtag for today is hash digital economy. So before I uh, talk about the report itself, I just want to hand over to um, Easy Vidra, who is head of campus here, um, to say a few words of welcome um, and to set the scene for us. So Easy, over to you. Thanks, hi everyone. My name is Easy Vidra, and I'm the head of campus. I usually say Easy like Sunday morning, so it's <laughs> memorable to you. Welcome to campus. It's uh, interesting to see a lot of suits today, but uh, we'll manage it. Nevertheless, you're welcome. So we're, <laughs> we're here to discuss... <laughs> we don't discriminate. We're here to discuss uh, the, the findings of the policy exchange report, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about campus and, and what we do to support entrepreneurs on the ground. The way that I usually describe campus is uh, as an open source building. If there was an equivalent between real estate and software, campus would be this open source building where we as Google set up a platform where working with multiple partners including uh, Tech Hub, Seedcamp, Central Working, Codec, uh, Startup Weekend and other partners and working with the startup community we power the, the ecosystem of startups in London. So we've been around to give you a little bit of a high level uh, for six months although I certainly aged more than six months and we, we have over 100 startups that are based in campus, hundreds of people that come to work uh, at campus every day, and um, lots of activity and, and community and events. So if I could characterize why startups have work, or what's important about a place like campus, is that they provide three main things. One is community. If you're an entrepreneur trying to uh, you know, innovate in a city of butchers, good luck to you, it's gonna be pretty tough. So the community of peers uh, can teach you a lot and can show you the way of how other people are doing it and, and help you grow in that way. The other thing is numbers. We, something that was maybe missing a little bit in the UK uh, is this density of network. The sheer numbers of entrepreneurs, backers, and you know, lawyers, accountants, etc., the service providers, uh, developers, customers, people that will test your app. And I think that in a very short period of time we were able to create this gravitational pull that suddenly uh, the community is coming together. And the third thing that is really influenced by the numbers and by the <coughs> strength of the community is this elusive factor of uh, serendipity or chance. There's a lots of uh, maybe luck or this magic factor in the success of a startup. And in the short time that we've been around, I'm happy to say that we hopefully are providing all of those uh, to startups. So, we offer free and, and uh, inexpensive workspace for startups. We offer weekly mentorship <coughs> programs every Friday where Googlers come and speak with the startups and mentor them about different topics. We are about to launch an educational program called Campus EDU, which is an open source curriculum for <coughs> entrepreneurs for the different uh, types of the startup life cycle working with universities and with corporates. So I don't want to take too much time um, from the report, but I would just say that you know, we, this is a, a particularly important time to launch the report because as the UK and the continent, we're all desperate for growth and the growth is going to come from young companies, from early stage companies and, you know, a large portion of them is going to be on the internet and digital economy. So we should do everything we can to support. So 
a tagline for campus that says, let's fill this town with startups. And I hope that with your finding, we can fill this country with startups. Thank you very much. Easy, thank you. And um, well, I've got a tie on, but depending on how we go, maybe I'll uh, take it off before <laughs> the end. Well, we'll see. Okay, so um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time um, telling you about the high level findings from our research. Um, and really, just to um, kick off really with why we, why we chose to spend um, some of our time at Policy Exchange on the digital economy. Um, and the reason is pretty simple digital businesses, um, as all of you will know, um, are genuinely changing the world. And four in 10 of us carry an iPhone or a smart device. Um, Amazon now sells more Kindle books than paperbacks and hardbacks put together. Um, if you flip on the TV or the radio, you'll find presenters urging us to get in touch via Twitter or Facebook. Um, and I think it's been over 10 years now since people started using the word Google as a verb. Um, and it doesn't look like there's any chance of that uh, turning back. And the businesses behind these kind of changes have some big things in common. They're all extremely ambitious. They've all grown astonishingly fast. And they all rely on smart people to turn visionary ideas into great everyday products. Now, the Prime Minister says that he wants the UK to be the best place in the world to start, run, and grow a high-tech business. And as a strategy for rebalancing the economy, this makes a lot of sense. Digitization is one of the great trends driving the modern economy. The internet already accounts for a greater share of GDP in the UK than any other G20 country. <coughs> We have a fantastic tradition of design and innovation in the UK, more world-leading universities than any other country apart from the United States. So, in our view, if we get a few other things right, there's tremendous potential for growth. So enterprise matters, and it's high-impact entrepreneurship that matters the most. The exciting digital startups that are emerging up and down the UK will have a real and lasting impact on the economy if, and only if, they scale up. And in his speech in Birmingham yesterday, the Prime Minister set out his vision for the UK to be, become an aspiration economy. He talked about getting Britain on the rise, um, needing a whole new economy, more enterprising, more aspirational, um, and said that it's not just about the old industries, but also about the new ones. <coughs> so for today's discussion, what I'd like to do is for us to take the government's ambitions for the digital economy at face value, and talk a bit about what more policymakers can do to help digital startups to scale up. And the analysis in our report was broken down across six pillars. Digital skills, ambition, investments, mentors, agility, and creativity. In all of these areas, there are lessons to learn from success stories around the world, and clues about how public policy in the UK could be upgraded in the 21st century. So I will just give a very brief tour through each of those six pillars um, before we uh, open up the conversation. So first up was skills, and skills for technology in particular. Skills and human capital remain the most important foundation for successful, innovative enterprises to get off the drawing board and continue their journey from startup to scale. Growth in the digital economy is increasing demand for people with strong digital skills and backgrounds in science, technology, engineering, and math. Over the medium term, we need to look to our education system to put more emphasis both on the ability to create digital products, on science, and on the creative disciplines that provide a foundation for employment in the digital economy. In the near term, making it easier to tap into the global pool of digital talent would help ensure that today's digital startups are still around to employ our school leavers and graduates of the future. Second was ambition. Now, achieving dramatic success as a digital entrepreneur takes a rare combination of talent, ambition, determination, persistence, and maybe a little luck. We've been talking about the UK's enterprise culture for long enough to know that we can't shift national mindsets overnight, <coughs> or simply cut and paste entrepreneurial atti um, attitudes from other countries. In the context of high impact digital enterprise, however, we can and should be putting more energy into getting our most talented young people to think about founding or working for a startup when weighing their career options. Universities, students, businesses, and the government all have a role to play in shaping how people think about the future. 
third pillar was around investment and finance, and in particular finance for scaling up. Taking an innovation from inception to market and preparing for long-term expansion takes time and money. There's no two ways about it. And the ability to access external finance is critical. The different parts of the finance industry come together to form a funding ladder, running from initial angel and seed funding all the way through to a trade sale or initial public offering. There are already a range of tax relief and exemptions designed to incentivize investment in venture capital and enterprise-related activity. And of course, the Chancellor has just announced a new scheme to reward owner employees. Nevertheless, we think that more could be done to encourage a wide range of investors to recycle their gains into funding new businesses. And perhaps over a longer horizon, action on the UK's relatively high rates of capital gains tax and stamp duty on shares might also send a positive message to global investors. Our fourth pillar was mentoring and the broader startup ecosystem. Now, aspiring high impact entrepreneurs need support that goes beyond investment. Good mentors provide essential advice and guidance and can act as an invaluable sounding board for dealing with the many and varied challenges of scaling up a business. And often, the most credible advice and support comes from mentors with direct experience. One of the most important benefits of startup clusters is achieving critical mass and positive feedback in the, world, in the pool of potential mentors of all sorts, which includes peers, business partners, investors, and industry experts. We think that future initiatives need to focus on sustaining the welcome trend of established businesses, setting up a presence in startup clusters, and helping them to play an important, active, and productive role in the startup community across the UK. Um, and it's tremendously pleasing to be doing this event at campus, which is one of those places. Fifth in my list was agility. So starting a business is risky. <coughs> you know that. Um, for entrepreneurs, a key faculty is the ability to pivot when the business demands it, responding rapidly to feedback and changing direction to ensure that the business has the best chance of success. For this to work, the broader business environment needs to be flexible and it needs to look kindly on the sorts of compromises and hacks that the early stages of high impact enterprise often demand. For individual startups wanting to scale up, there is a particular need to be able to take on staff with minimal bureaucracy and to lay stuff off quickly and fairly should circumstances dictate. For the broader digital economy, evidence from the United States shows there could be significant benefits from a labor market where there is more cross-pollination of ideas and more freedom for highly skilled employees to move between firms. These themes of flexibility for employers and for employees are complementary and need to be explored further. And the final pillar in, uh, in the list from our report was around creativity, certainty, and copyright. If data is the raw material for the digital economy, then the rules around copyright are fundamentally important for high-impact digital enterprise. Now, weighing the relative merits of varying interpretations of the right to privacy against different degrees of protection of intellectual property is clearly not a trivial task. For now, the insight that I'd like us to hold on to is the importance of a regulatory regime that provides certainty for entrepreneurs, investors, and consumers. Attempts to modernize the UK's copyright laws have a history of stalling. The conclusions of the most recent review have been broadly accepted by the government, and we would like to see the residual uncertainty cleared up sooner rather than later. So those are the six themes from our reports, and if you want to explore them in more detail, we can have the conversation today, and of course you can pull the report down, down from the website. So we talked about skills, ambition, finance, mentoring, agility, and creativity. Um, now at this point, I guess I would say, don't just take my word for it. Um, we talked to a lot of people during the course of our work, including a large number of entrepreneurs and investors, um, and the startup businesses that they're backing. Um, and I thought that you might be interested to hear their take um, in their own words. So we've got a uh, short montage on the video, which I will uh, pull up on the screen for. Well, especially in Britain, that you don't have the sort of talent pool that a lot of people have in America. So you don't have a wealth of programmers coming out of university. I'm finding it really difficult at the moment to recruit technical talent. I'm competing with not only the, the banks, but also with the likes of Google and Facebook. It's quite difficult to sell a proposition of a really small company when you don't have um, the ability to train technical talent. 
the biggest challenge for digital entrepreneurs, in my experience, is finding the right talent, um, hiring good people, and that's identifying both local but also foreign people and then bringing them into the country to help you scale the company. We've tried to bring in some excellent people from abroad. Myself, I'm German and I chose to start my company here, and we would like to get people uh, into our team from abroad more easily. One example is we've had a great candidate who has a PhD who studied in English but due to the home office language tests it took us seven months to actually get him to join the team in which time we could have you know, worked more productively. I think two of the most significant challenges that digital businesses in the UK face today is access to world-class talent and in building world-class digital businesses talent is at the core of everything. There is a unbalanced education system, unfortunately, that produces too few great maths and science graduates into the economy every year. Digital businesses in Britain are suffering because of that. And secondly, the very restrictive immigration policies around skilled uh, workers and skilled migrants make it very challenging to attract the best talent in the world to come in and help uh, grow UK digital businesses. Um, I think when you think of the UK specifically, um, I think there is a you know, there is a great um, concern amongst uh, you know amongst peers and colleagues that you know we can't find the talent um, that uh, the talent is is um, hard to come by because there seems to be a lack of I think um, emphasis in education in all things digital, um, be that at a secondary school level uh, or indeed. Uh, university level. So I think uh, the more that can be done in that area uh, to help uh, young adults understand and appreciate how the economy um, is changing, how we're becoming more digitally uh, focused and aligned, um, I think that will help a great deal. I think the biggest challenge for any digital entrepreneur is raising capital. Capital is always a big, big challenge for digital entrepreneurs. It was for us. It took us a long time to raise the capital we needed to get off the ground, and we think that's the number one issue facing entrepreneurs today. So for us, certainly, our biggest problems are, are being taken seriously by big business. Mm -hmm. So finding, finding really good mentors things like that is, is a really big problem for us at the moment. Or more support to sort of making the connections between big business and very small business would really help, as well as a financial incentive for people to actually go into entrepreneurship rather than not going to big business instead. To be able to get venture capital and private equity investment alongside them, providing the mentoring which we know they so desperately need because that's what they keep on telling us. So they, they want the mentors, they want the people who've been there before, who've, who've built the companies, who've sold them, who've got the money to reinvest and say, just learn from me, this is what I can do to help. The second big area um, I feel is copyright. So for digital startups, it's extremely important that they have uh, security around the copyright legislation and that they have flexibility to work with digital assets like music, uh, film and text. And uh, my wish therefore is that the Hargraves recommendations would be put into place because that would make it much easier for companies like Mendeley to you know, help uh, make science more open, more collaborative and build our business here in the UK. Okay, so um, a range of perspectives there from uh, real life entrepreneurs. Um, we've got a fantastic um, selection of speakers today to explore some of these issues further. So what I will do is um, introduce them to each, say a few words, um, share their perspectives on some of the issues that have been raised, um, and then uh, once I've given them each a chance to share their views, um, I'll open it up to questions and we can have a discussion, discussion in the room. So our first, uh, first speaker now is Sam Gima MP. We're delighted to have Sam with us. Um, Sam was elected as the Member of Parliament for East Surrey in May 2010. He's a Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Prime Minister, um, has a wide range of interests including the economy, education, planning and the local environment as well as international development. And Sam, I think you also have history as an entrepreneur yourself. So um, without any further ado, I will hand over to you to share your perspectives on the <coughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you all very much for coming. And I understand that uh, you had Michael Fallon, the excellent business minister here earlier today, and uh, now you've got me. And I guess, if anything, that highlights to you how seriously um, the government and sending conservatives are taking the issue of entrepreneurship, business, and getting businesses going as a way of jump-starting and accelerating the healing process of the UK economy. A second thing I'd like to say is that welcome the report. And one of the things that I found most interesting about the report is that you actually spoke to people who are the co-face of um, building and starting up businesses. It's very easy for a think tank to churn out some ideas that have been cooked up in, um, in a sort of an office not too far away from the Houses of Parliament. But I think this is certainly one of those areas where it makes a lot of sense speaking to the people who are on the ground. In terms of my own experience, as you mentioned, Chris, I have I was an entrepreneur after a while in investment banking and certainly experienced the ups and downs, or a lot of the ups and downs that are highlighted in the report that you've published uh, today. And I guess one of the interesting things is um, Google Campus in that context, being an entrepreneur is incredibly, and it can be an incredibly lonely experience. You leave a normal company where you've got peers, you've got a boss, you've got people underneath you, and where there is a structure and there are clear set of expectations, and then you decide to pursue an idea, often without the resources, or the resources immediately available to you. And that is the lot of an entrepreneur. You do it, and success is affected by a whole number of things, your own knowledge, your own drive, whether you hit the market at the right time, whether you have the right team around you, whether you get capital when you need it, when you, whether you can access skills. And in that context, having an organization like Google Campus makes a huge difference, I would imagine, to people who are pursuing the entrepreneurial path. But also, I suspect for Google, also, they are being quite smart. I mean, the UK um, internet, uh, UK, the internet sector is supposedly contributing, I think, about 8% to UK GDP. So from Google's perspective, position yourself where you are in the flow of all the ideas and people trying to do things in a sector that's projected to contribute 12% to GDP is quite smart for Google. But one of the interesting things about entrepreneurship from a political perspective is because so much of it relies on the enterprise, the flair, and the drive of the individual. It's very difficult, I think, to think what can government really do to make it flourish and prosper. As a result of which I think the area of entrepreneurship, as far as public policy is concerned, isn't as well researched in the UK as it has been in the US. I mean, in the UK you've got, I mean, what you're doing, policy exchange is doing, I know Nesta, with whom I've worked on a number of projects where they're doing quite a lot of work on innovation. And but you look at the US and you've got organizations like the Kaufman Foundation, that are diving really deep into what makes, what is an entrepreneur and what are the critical factors you need to make entrepreneurship successful. And as the uh, Prime Minister said yesterday in his speech, I think if we are going to create an aspiration, <coughs> then entrepreneurship has got to be at its heart. You've got to have people going out there, pursuing ideas, not always with the resources available, but being able to bring those resources to bear and build businesses that will be successful. Not all of them will be successful, that's the nature of entrepreneurship. And in that context, I also um, have um, experience of that. But that is the, dy the dynamism you need in the economy to really build an aspiration uh, nation. But it's not just about the individual, because when you read the papers and we talk about individuals and entrepreneurship, we talk about the individual entrepreneurs who've made a lot of money, who've built their businesses into huge successes. Dyson, you know, Mike Lynch had autonomy, um, Google being a good example. But somehow in that discussion, what we don't always talk about are the jobs that are created. And so for, in terms of the political discussion, it becomes quite easy to, for people to jump on policies that bash entrepreneurs bash wealth, creator, wealth creators rather than celebrating them. But a piece of Nesta research shows that um, innovative firms grew twice as fast, employed more people, and I think the, the, there's a report that the vital 6%, which says over 50% of the jobs are created by 6% of the, 
of our companies. But there's also the spillover effect. A University of Maryland study suggests that the Facebook app economy alone contributes 182,000 jobs in the US and has a value of $12 billion. And that is just the ecosystem uh, around uh, Facebook. So entrepreneurship is important if we want to create an aspiration economy. It is important to create the conditions for individuals to pursue those dreams because when they do and they're successful, obviously they achieve what they want to achieve. But it is also important if we're going to create jobs, which is one of the big challenges we face as we come out of the current economic situation. Fortunately, if you look at where the UK economy is and where our entrepreneurship is today, we're doing quite well. You know, we've got Silicon Roundabout, and I think there's a piece of research that says there are about 3,200 firms employing some like 48,000 workers around that ecosystem. As Chris mentioned, we've got world-leading universities, and the, w, uh, the World Economic Foundation grants the UK scientific research facilities as third in the world, and that's absolutely critical, especially in this sector, if you're going to get the talent that you need. And then Cambridge alone has spawned something like 3,000 companies and created more than 200 millionaires out of that in uh, the university system there. We've got a high uh, rate of business creation. Last year, the rate of uh, startups created was, I think, the highest we've had in something like 30 to 40 years. The big challenge, though, if we're going to measure entrepreneurship and its success, is how many of these startups translate into high impact entrepreneurship. I think as your report um, highlights, 100 of the world's top 115 <coughs> private digital startups come from the US, and more than half from California alone. The UK has just four, you know, Mind Candy and my Mini Clip being examples. So that's really what we should be looking about. We should be looking at. We are success we are doing well. We've got a high rate of business startups. There are clearly a lot of people in the UK who want to be entrepreneurs, but how do you translate their those dreams and ambitions into high impact uh, companies? And this is where public policy is very important because public policy needs to really look at what government can do rather than just say this is about individuals and individuals pursuing their dreams and actually government just needs to step out of the way. There are areas in where government needs to do that, but government also needs to help facilitate those uh, dreams and ambitions. And the first thing I think we need to look at when we look at facilitating those ambitions is trying to inject and encourage a spirit of adventure. As I said, being an entrepreneur is not easy and not everything succeeds. But a fear of failure is certainly one thing that would stop businesses growing and really reaching their potential. I think something like 43% of people in the UK compared to 19% in the US believe that a new business should not be created if there is a chance that it may fail. And you have a lot of businesses that therefore maybe do not get launched for that particular reason. And a point that Alistair Heath from CTAM has made a number of times is also the number of UK businesses that sell out as soon as they can rather than trying to become very large businesses because you cut your losses, Take. And that, that may be a sensible investment strategy, but that's something that we need to uh, get rid of. But the biggest single thing I think that we need to look at when we look at um, entrepreneurial businesses growing in the UK, we've got risk aversion, we've got, we've got to encourage aspiration, is I think the issue of investment and access to finance. The political debate, certainly since I became a member of parliament, has really been focused around bank lending and debt finance. <coughs> and understandably so, there are a number of businesses, a lot of businesses out there that rely on debt finance to grow their business. But what the research, all the research suggests is that not enough businesses focus on equity investment as a way of growing their business. Now, I can understand why the political debate is where it is. The banks played a role in the current crisis that we're <coughs> still trying to, uh, working hard to get out of. And the sense of, part of the way the sense of retribution manifests itself is to bash the banks and say, if we bash the banks, they lend more. If only we did that, the economy would be fine. The banks have their challenges, but the important thing as far as the digital sector is concerned 
is that most of the companies in this sector are actually maybe not suitable in the early stages of their growth for bank finance. If you have a company that a, an internet business that has even three or four million users, you may take the view that rather than trying to plaster your website with advertising or trying to monetize your users, that you want to actually go for growth. And what that means is that to fund your staff um, and your operations, you need to get the money from somewhere. Now, if you go to a bank that relies on security principally in order to fund you, that business doesn't have the security offer to provide to the bank. So that business needs investors who are willing to provide capital that they would lose if the venture failed, but they would do very well out of if the venture was successful. And so the political debate needs to move from just focusing on bank finance and bank lending and really grapple with some of the challenges around equity investment. A lot has been done so far by the government. So for example, entrepreneurs relief. If you invest in a business and you're an entrepreneur, up to the first 10 million pounds, and then you pay next 10% uh, capital gains, I think I've got it right. Um, then you've got other things like um, and the enterprise investment scheme, which I think is a great scheme, and it's good that the government has relaxed the rules around that. When most people start businesses, they go to friends and family in order to raise the capital that they need to launch the business. And relaxing the rules, that means that there are very generous tax breaks for people who take that risk, I think is right. But then there is the question of how, when these businesses reach a certain size and need to grow. And there, there are gaps and differences between what, what goes on in the UK versus what goes on in the US. Um, I think less than, in the US, you're more likely to raise growth capital than you are in the UK. And there, the government has tried to plug the gap with the business growth fund, which is making equity investments in fast growing businesses. But we need to do more. And I think to do more, we need to look at the, some of the structural reasons. And one of the reasons that I would highlight is the imbalance in our system between funding for debt, debt funding and equity funding. So debt funding is uh, tax deductible, equity funding is not. So we've skewed our system for businesses to look to banks to raise capital rather than actually go out there and raise equity capital, that is risk capital, and also hopefully that is patient capital that would sit with the business and often, if you get it right, would come with expertise. If someone invests in your business and you're likely to lose everything, if the business doesn't do well, they want to be there every step of the way to make sure that you are successful. Well, that's how it should work. And I mean, looking at the sister structure of our tax system so that we level the playing field between debt and equity funding is one of the ways in which we can unlock capital to flow into digital, fast growing digital businesses. So not only do we need individuals who want to take the risk, we also need to help investors who have got to a sitting on huge piles of cash look at this sector and think, I'm going to invest in this sector. Now the consequences of not getting it right are that you would have businesses that reach a certain stage of growth and decide that actually relocating outside the UK is something that is a preferable option to being here. I remember several years ago, um, Bebo, um, just before it was so decided to move from Ireland where it was to the US. And one of the reasons they did that, well, one of the purported reasons was obvious access to skills, um, being in the ecosystem where there are a lot of um, uh, advisors, etc., but also just capital. And what we want to do, <coughs> we're going to be the best place in the world to start and grow a business. We have the opportunity to build a competitive advantage so that rather than it, the UK business is thinking, well, actually, if you really want to be a global internet business, you've got to be located in Silicon Valley. We want European businesses to think if you want to be a global internet business in Europe, the UK is the place to go to. And so we need to look at the, um, that structural issue. And then on the other end, uh, right at the end of the um, growth cycle, we need the opportunity for businesses to exit or raise capital from the public market. So you start off raising money from family and friends. As you grow and develop, you may look at ins private institutions to invest in you. And then in the end, you know, depending on how much, you, if you want to read hundreds of millions, um, depending on who your friends are, and I certainly don't have those friends, you have to go to the public markets in order to do so. And the US has the NASDAQ, where a lot of technology companies 
look to raise capital. And I think we need to look at creating some of those um, incentives here so UK businesses can access those sort of public markets to raise the capital. That means you can then go and conquer the world. And so I think that is the single biggest thing we need to address. There are a number of other issues uh, that have been touched on in the report in terms of access to skills, mentoring, which you know, things like Google Campus um, are tackling. But I think if we really unlock capital, we have a lot of the people who have ideas, who are starting businesses at the moment, have the opportunity to turn those businesses from ideas and small businesses into world leaders. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much, and a lot of food for thought now. Um, now, I'd like to uh, invite our second speaker, Theo Bertram from uh, Google. Uh, to spend a bit of time uh, with us. And Theo was a special advisor at number 10, um, and after leaving government was head of public affairs at O2 before joining Google as their UK policy manager. So, Theo, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think the truth is it's a very, very tough time to start a business today. Um, investors are wary, government is cashless, and if you're in a paid job, you'd be crazy to leave it at the moment. So it, it's a very difficult time to start a business. But now is the time more than ever when we need those people who are willing to take the risk um, to take the plunge. And that is the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the people who work here. And nothing empowers them more than the internet. Nothing lowers the barriers for them more than the internet. So I think there's good reasons for um, policymakers uh, to look to uh, the internet space to power growth in the UK. Um, and I'll give you three reasons why. The first one is, it's where the growth is already. Um, the most, compe most compelling uh, fact that I read in, in, in Chris's report was uh, almost a quarter of the growth over the last five years in the UK has come from the internet economy. So it's almost a quarter of all growth from the internet economy. So this is the area where there's already growth. So that's a good reason. The second reason I would pick is we're good at it. You know, we want to pick races that we're going to win. Um, and if we're not backing companies, we can certainly back sectors. And if you look at the internet economy, we buy and sell more per person than any other country on earth. We buy and sell more per person than the Chinese, than the Americans, than any other BRICS. We export three times more than we, than we import online. Yeah. So on the internet, we are world leaders. So that's another good reason to back this. We're good at it. And the third reason I would say that it's worth um, backing this race is um, what I think Sam called the, uh, the, the spillover effect. And it isn't just the idea, I think, that, that uh, the likes of Facebook and, and eBay and everyone else is creating new markets. But there's a, if I can extend the spillover metaphor, there's a, there's a trickle down as well. Um, and the trickle down is, is, uh, is, is that when you have a place like this, you're building up uh, talent and innovation. And that spread of skills is absolutely essential to not just internet businesses, but every business. <coughs> there isn't a business in the country that isn't going to need better data skills, better, better computing, better engineering skills. And creating and harnessing the internet space will have a knock-on effect on those other industries. Raising the skills, increasing efficiency and productivity in those places, um, and enabling them to lower the barriers to, to starting a business, uh, whether that's an internet business or whether that's a, a retail business or any other kind. So those three reasons. Uh, growth is where it is. Um, uh, we're good at this. And thirdly, uh, that trickle down, still over and trickle down, Jerry on board. So, um, so uh, there's good reason to focus on this area for government policy. Um, but clearly, you know, as, as Sam has said, I think you know, government can't pull a lever and make everything all right for investors and, and make everything all right for entrepreneurs. Um, but they can create the right conditions. And I think um, in Chris's report, I mean, there, are, there are 10 recommendations in there which I think are, are really strong, but there's two which I'd pick out in particular, and they were both pulled out in the, uh, by the startups themselves. One would be copyright. Uh, the reality is at the moment that the antiquity and complexity of copyright law deters innovation. So our copyright law was last updated in 1988. So it just about got the idea that tape recorders were doing things. 
It didn't really work out the computers were doing things. And the internet, it had no idea about. And you know, the Communications Act in 2003 didn't even mention the word internet once. So government has a long way to catch up. And the good thing is the government has been serious about this and they've put in place a set of proposals called the Hargreaves recommendations. And those are all about updating copyright law, making it so that it's not illegal to copy uh, a CD onto your iPod. Um, and, and it's not illegal to do some of the things that some of the, you know, the medical research charities want to do, where instead of doing things by hand, they just want to do them using computers. And at the moment, copyright law won't allow them. So updating copyright law will make a big difference to this sector. The second thing, and it's, it's talked about a great deal, is, um, is, is skills. And if you go downstairs, and, and while you're here today, you really should take the opportunity to look around and get the feel for the place. Downstairs is usually full. Of all the spaces are, are full of people working. But if you look on the notice board, it's a fairly rare thing uh, it, it, at the moment, which is a wall full of job adverts. And if you, there's just all these post-it notes, so it's, it's a very digital place here, but they still use post-it notes to, uh, to do most of their key communications. And it's post-it notes saying um, that we're looking for developers, we're looking for an engineer, uh, we're looking for someone with, with Python, with Java, or with whatever their skills are. And we, we don't produce enough of those in this country. For too long, computer science in schools became teaching kids to use word processing rather than teaching kids to do computing. And when I grew up, I remember that the BBC did a scheme where they put BBC computers into every school. And even, even me, and I, I'm terrible at, at programming, um, I, even I was forced to learn line 10, print name, line 20, go to line 10, and my name would appear on the screen all the way down. And then you could start to do my best friend smells, and then that would appear <laughs> down the screen. And pretty much everyone I knew could at least do that simple two lines of coding. Uh, but that was, you know, we taught a nation to code. And 20 years later, we had one of the world's best game software industries in the world. And that wasn't a coincidence. That's because we inspired a generation to code and to build their own computer games. And I think there's cause to think about how do we do that again. Um, so skills is a big challenge. And uh, copyright is a big challenge. But I think all the recommendations in Chris's report are really important. I think um, digital uh, startups uh, can't on their own power uh, the growth of a new industrial strategy, power the growth of an economy. But I think with government support, they can really be a key stimulus to getting us out of the economy we're in. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you very much. Our third speaker is Marcus Stuttard. Marcus is Head of AIM and has responsibility for primary markets in the UK across both AIM and the main markets. Um, he's responsible for the management and development of AIM Stock Exchange's international growth market for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. So, Marcus. Good afternoon. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, you've heard my name is Marcus Stuttard. I'm responsible for our growth market uh, at the Stock Exchange. Um, what I want to focus on today really is, I think, the um, recommendations around capital. Um, <coughs> what fascinates me about the conversation so far is that you know, a lot of the companies that have been named as world leaders, um, they're all companies that have gone public. Um, and for me that demonstrates one key aspect and one benefit of becoming a public company. And that is the profile and the visibility that being a public company brings that being a private business doesn't tend to have. And so, you know, I feel very strongly, and I've, um, I was here a couple of weeks ago when David Willits made an announcement about um, ways to open up our main market for high growth and technology businesses. Um, and, you know, there's a lot going on in this space. But, I, you know, I feel very passionately that if more companies had the confidence that they could float, then we would get a next generation of high growth businesses. Um, you know, I think the government has actually done a really good job with some of the seed capital um, tax breaks, things like CDIS, CIS, the Venture Capital Trust Regime. And you know, I, I know from my first hand experience of you know, being here, being at Seed Camp, being at the Maid Festival in Sheffield a couple of weeks ago, you know, we have got 
a really fantastic crop of entrepreneurs and startup businesses and you know, brilliant technology coming out of the universities and out of this area of London, but in clusters all around the country. So we've got a lot of the right ingredients. But I think what is missing is not just the aspiration, but also the confidence amongst business teams and management teams that they can get a business to scale. So, you know, so you were mentioning earlier about um, businesses that sell out too early. And I, you know, I often describe it as the rectory effect, you know, of the management team that you know, their aspiration is to go and buy the local rectory in the Aston Martin and then it's kind of job done. And you know, that's great. And I can I can really understand that because a lot of these guys you know, haven't paid their mortgage for a few months or you know have had real personal hardship to get to the stage where they can buy the rectory. But actually if we can give more people confidence that they can go beyond that and not just buy the rectory, but they can actually create the next FTSE 250 business, you know, the next ARM, the next autonomy, the next Google, then we will be in a much, much stronger position. And it's not just about 100 million pound companies. You know, we, one of the reasons that we operate AIM and the main market at the um, London Stock Exchange, and why we're one of the very few exchanges in the, in the world that does that, is that you know, if we don't have the next generation of smaller companies, that can grow up to be mid-cap and larger companies, then we've got a, a problem, a real challenge. Um, so, you know, we see companies like um, Blur came to market last Friday on AIM. It's a, a crowdsourcing business. You know, we, we've had a whole range of tech businesses come through this year. So there are some really positive signs, but, you know, Sam's absolutely right and the report is absolutely right to focus on this challenge that we've got where Debt finance is um, tax deductible, and equity finance is taxed four times. And um, you know, I'm conscious that it's a, a damp Thursday afternoon, and you don't want me to bore you about tax legislation. But we need to do something to balance that up, and to go from um, from you know the, the platform we've got, where we've got great tax breaks for seed capital, to the next the next level. Um, because it isn't just about finance, it is about job creation and innovation. And just to give you a real life case study, um, you know, earlier this year we had, um, not, not in the creative industry space, but we had um, a company based in Crawley called you know, Edwards, some of you will know they provide vacuums for semiconductor fa factories, and they decided that they couldn't float in the, uh, the UK. Um, and we, you know, as I said earlier, we're doing things to rectify that. But they floated on NASDAQ and actually haven't had a very good time so far. But what they have done since floating in the US is they've created, um, I think, you know, a couple of hundred jobs in the US. Um, because, you know, not only is their listing, but their whole business model has moved to become US focused. They contrast that with one disco that joined um, AIM a couple of months later, whose share price has doubled, and they, you know, they've employed people in Belfast. Um, since listing because of the capital they got through their listing. So, you know, there's a really important goal here and a, and a really important prize. So, you know, I absolutely recommend this, um, this piece of research and the debate that we're having. It's, you know, it's great to be on panels where we're talking about, you know, where you know, your business is and where this space fits into the whole funding ladder. And just, you know, one final <coughs> point for me. Um, I'm absolutely not in the category of uh, bashing the banks because I do think that we've got um, a real mismatch of expectations. So, you know, over 50% of SMEs finance their businesses with, um, with bank finance in the UK and Europe. And, and a shocking proportion of those businesses actually use credit cards to finance, um, finance themselves. You know, if you look at the US and contrast that, I think only 17% of growth businesses use bank finance. So actually, we're already out of kilter. Um, and so it's not that necessarily the bank should be lending more. I think we've just got the wrong expectations. <coughs> and the reality is that, you know, with um, Basel regulations, solvency regulations, and trying to get risk out of, uh, out of the banking system, you know, that's only going to go in one way. So we do need to be looking at a wider range of financing mechanisms. And you know, equity has to be, um, be one of those. So you know, actually, I'm very positive about the outlook because you know, I think we've got 
a great set of entrepreneurs, some brilliant technology and innovation. We've got business angels and seed capital. We've got the most vibrant venture capital community outside of the US. So we've got lots of really good foundations, but if we can just build on some of the recommendations in this report, I think we could be in an even better situation in five to 10 years time. Thank you. Marcus, thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce Joe Cohen. Um, Joe is founder and CEO of um, Seedwave, and he's been building consumer applications and businesses in the US and Europe since the mid-1990s. Um, he started Seedwave in May 2006, launched it in February 2007, and um, together with his team, has built the biggest fan-to-fan -fan ticketing marketplace in Europe. So Joe will have some first-hand experience of what it's like scaling a uh, digital business. Joe. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for coming. So when, when entrepreneurs sit around and talk with one another, um, we don't actually wring our hands about whether London's as good as Silicon Valley. And um, none of us actually started our businesses because being an entrepreneur gives you an advantageous tax position or there's an advantageous tax regime. So I don't think either of those actually incent anyone or create any more entrepreneurs than would exist already. We generally do this, well in my case I do it because I'm not skilled to do anything else. Um, I never finished university, I really didn't have much to do and so I had to figure out what to do along the way. And the, the things that we do talk about when we sit around are, um, if I want a high speed connection for my office, why does it take 100 days to do that? And why does City Road have to get dug up seven times in a year to run cables underneath it? It's a great mystery of the world, right? Like that's a mystery of the ages. Um, we talk about that. We talk about talent and skills a lot and how hard it is to find talent and skills, whether it's homegrown or bringing people in. I've been living in the UK for 13 years. I've decided to make London my home, originally from the US. And the skill issue is really a key one. And so that's the area that I'd like to focus on the most because I actually think it's the one area of the six that policy can have an impact. The other five, I think policy could have an impact but the things you need to do go across election cycles and it becomes very complicated, right? So on skills, just a few stats. The UK creates between 12 and 15,000 new engineers every year. Uh, China produces 600,000, India produces about 500,000, the US between 75 and 100,000 per year. So way behind in that area. 4% of university students in the UK read engineering of any kind at a degree level today, 4%. So when there were student protests in London a couple of years ago about the price of an education, I was really depressed about this. Number one, because I thought they were protesting about the price of an education that wasn't going to help them get a job that was going to lead to a career and wasn't going to help the broader economy because we are the last generation where you can have a competitive economy in this, in this world without a lot of engineering talent. Um, the other thing that was, that was somewhat depressing about it is that the day after those protests here in London, Google announced it was giving a $1,000 raise to every employee globally. And a 10% raise and a $1,000 bonus, I think it was, because they didn't have enough talent, they had to retain the people they had. So here we had thousands of students in the streets protesting that they were gonna have to pay nine grand for a humanities degree that wasn't gonna do them jack, right? So what can we do, right? <coughs> Let's make engineering degrees free, and let's make humanities degree 100,000 a year. <laughs> That's a good start, right? Let's, let's move this to market-based pricing, right? We know something about marketplaces in this country for sure. So that's one thing we can do. So, so look, we, we really have this dearth of talent that we have to address because the creation of intellectual property is where value gets created, and being able to out-execute your competition is where value gets created. And those two things require talent. So, um, about two years ago, I got together with Rich Mix um, just over on uh, Bethlehem Green Road, and we created a program called Dev Camp, and we've run it for two summers now, where we, um, we invite 14 to 18 year olds from Tower Hamlets and Hackney to come in for three weeks, and we have volunteers from the tech community, and we train them in how to build Facebook apps, how to build web apps, and how to build mobile apps. And we know at the end of that three week course, we're not gonna have great 14 year old engineers, but we're trying to ignite some passion in the indigenous folks who live in Tower Hamlets where all of this is happening. 
Many of you may not know this, but Tower Hamlets has the largest gap in daytime and nighttime income in the UK. Right? The people who work here during the day and the people who live here at night, it's the largest gap in income. Unless we engage <coughs> folks who live here, who are from Tower Hamlets, in everything that's going on in this area, in the technology growth, I think what we saw in the riots a couple years ago, we'll see more of that in the future. Right? And that's not to scare anybody, but the fact of the matter is like, we've got to engage folks who do this. You know, you see Silicon Milk Roundabout is coming up in the next week or so again. You know, entry-level coding jobs are 30 grand a year, right, in a lot of companies. I mean, that's life-changing for many kids who are growing up in the Boundary Estate right now. No one in their family has ever made 30 grand in a year, right? So we actually have the ability to build skills in the economy that we need to compete address income inequality, right, and, and hopefully, maybe, um, have somewhat of a more civil society at the same time. So that's the ways that I'd like to see approach. Thank you. Okay, and our final speaker is uh, Simon Clark. Simon is Managing Partner at Fidelity Growth Partners uh, Europe. Um, and he represents Fidelity as a committee member for the British and Prime Minister. Thanks for the seat wave. Thanks for the seat And a uh, committee member for the British uh, Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, um, which, as you will know, is the industry body for the UK uh, private equity and VC industry. So, Simon, over to you. Chris, thanks very much. All right. Forgive me while I hobble to the stage. I've quite managed to cripple myself. So, Chris, thanks very much, and thanks for a terrific report. Really, really good. Um, I realize I am the last person standing between you and Q&A, which is a lot more interesting than having us talk to you. Uh, so I'll try and keep it quick, I'll try and keep it cheerful. Uh, let me just do a quick introduction. Uh, as Chris said, I've been a venture capitalist here in London for, gosh, almost 12 years now. Uh, before that, I was at a startup, one of the very early dot-coms, uh, three years of madness, chaos, failure, success, you know, all the way from, oh my God, we can't make payroll, a uh, feeling everybody should have once, but only once, uh, to we've got a billion dollar market cap, are you kidding, uh, three years later. So um, it was quite a ride uh, and, and a great success. Uh, we've been extraordinarily lucky in Europe. Uh, we've been able to back companies like Joe's. Uh, we've been able to back a bunch of great success stories, and we've seen some terrific businesses here. And by the way, <coughs> we're seeing more and more terrific businesses every day. I'm going to pick a fight with Theo because everybody's been so nice to everybody else on this panel. It's absolutely insufferable. Um, I couldn't disagree more with your opening. Uh, I think this is a fabulous time to start a business, not an awful time. First of all, the existing jobs are as insecure as they've ever been, and the bonuses are crap. Second, the excitement is not in the company that's trying to protect a legacy that cannot be protected anymore. The excitement is in building something new. Uh, and all all of the aspects that made it hard in the past to start a business are dropping away. It's cheaper, it's easier, it's simpler. Government actually deserves a lot of credit because it's made it a lot easier to get businesses going. By the way, I thought uh, uh, the, the Osborne announcement earlier this week on free capital gains tax for employment rights was terrific and we welcome that and we've been very supportive. Uh, there's a lot going on that's really good, so uh, we have our time for it. Um, let me just spend a couple of minutes talking about why this matters, first of all, and then what the opportunity is here in the UK. Uh, so let's start with why it matters, because you know, of course we all care about it. By the way, how many entrepreneurs in the room? Mm, what, 30%? Great. How many want to be entrepreneurs in the room? <laughs> Good, a few more. Um, of course, we do this because we want to build companies. We do it because we can't possibly bear working for somebody else because we want to do our own thing. Uh, all of that's true. Uh, but the reason we get attention from people like Sam uh, is also because these jobs are good jobs and they matter. Uh, and probably the most interesting piece of work that's come out this year from an academic at Berkeley, a man called Enrico Moretti, he's written a terrific book called The New Geography of Jobs that shows that for every one of these high quality jobs, entrepreneurial jobs in high growth companies, uh, on average, we get five other jobs created around. Uh, this is the highest multiplier that you can have in job creation. So not only are these famous 6% high growth companies in themselves, not only are they companies that create wealth and 
coal around the world, but there are companies that create wealth around them as well. So this, is, this really matters. This is important stuff. Uh, and to be fair, all parties here in the UK, I think, have recognized that and are paying attention. So why am I so bullish on the UK? Why are we investing here? Why have we raised a big fund and putting money to work here? Well, frankly, this is one of the best places in the world to start and build and run a business. Uh, you've got a lot of things going for you. You've got extraordinary creativity, and this is an old UK story, right? And the, the amount of creativity and innovation is, has always been strong. Um, some of the best universities in the world, certainly some of the best academic work coming out anywhere in the world. But there are another couple of points uh, which don't get mentioned as much, uh, and I think are really important. Uh, the first is a naturally <coughs> global focus. The UK is blessed in many ways, not in its weather, um, but it's blessed in its time zone. Right? You've got a time zone that allows you to cover the world. It's blessed in a global heritage, in communities from around the world, in global links, and in general openness. Um, one thing I would criticize this government for is it's making it harder to have global businesses here. It's making it harder to be able to attract people from outside the European Union. This, as I think everybody's already said, is not smart. Um, but I know that there, there, there are voices that are uh, pushing it that much harder than I can. Uh, but the point is, this is a naturally global place. And London's a naturally global city, but not just London. Right? There's, um, I don't know if anybody read the FT today. There's a piece in the Financial Times about Manchester's Media City project and how many new media businesses are starting up there. And it's very exciting. We're seeing clusters all around the UK springing up and growing and building that density that Easy was talking about beforehand to be able to build businesses that support each other. And then one final thing, and probably in the long term the most exciting thing of all, is the mashup. You know, the first generation of technology startups were about the core technology, and they had to be. Right? We had to build the basic infrastructure. Largely done. We've been done, done that. The next generation, the companies that we're seeing now, and is a good example, are companies that bring technology and something else together. Whether that's media and tech, whether that's advertising and tech, whether it's healthcare and tech, and on and on and on. Where best to do that <coughs> than in a country that already has a lot of those businesses and can bring them together with technology to create something new? And it's the mashup, it's the ability to combine and to produce value in new ways that really creates growth, really, really creates opportunity. So what do we do? Uh, we need the skills. Uh, Joe talked wonderfully about the dev camp and about the uh, Silicon Milk roundabout. We've got to keep pushing. Be able to import skills, but we've also got to be able to build skills. And the two go together. They are not uh, in, a, in opposition. I mean, is that the lump of labor is a fallacy that we were all taught in undergraduate economics to, to get rid of. Yeah, it isn't like that. You bring skills, you teach skills, but we've got to make a real push on it. Um, the other area is that there's an awful lot of good work coming out of government trying to help businesses. Uh, unfortunately, maybe a little bit too much, uh, and we've got to find a way of having no wrong door, of having a joined up approach where no matter who we talk to, we get the full set of answers, we get the full set of, of support. One area that I, I think has made a big change recently, though, is that government's finally figured out that with a 17 billion pound sorry, IT budget, uh, they, they're power of the purse is really powerful and they can drive innovation by buying innovatively uh, and I would absolutely welcome the work that we've seen out of cabinet office, out of a whole bunch of government departments to buy cheaper, to buy better uh, and to buy much more flexible and I think you could encourage a lot of entrepreneurship that way and, uh, and, and a, lot of, a lot of very, very good work to do that. As far as we're concerned, I'm in the growth capital business, I'm, I'm here to fund businesses that want to be very big. Uh, there are plenty of us like that. Uh, at the British Venture Capital Association, we represent uh, the entire spectrum from the smallest angels up to the biggest private equity houses. Uh, this is now the second uh, biggest uh, home of capital in, of private equity capital in the world. Uh, we want to keep it and make it more and more attractive for people to want to start and build not just businesses, but the companies that fund businesses here in London, here in the UK. So let me stop there. And Chris, I think you want to open it up. Thanks. Excellent. Simon, thank you very much. So um, right now it's, uh, now it's your turn. So um, you've heard from me, you've heard from the speaker panel. 
Um, I'm going to open the floor to, to questions for a little while. We've got a roving mic, so um, if I have hands up if you want to ask a question, wait for the microphone to find you. Um, so we'll start with the gentleman, third row from the back. Just pay the Of course. Yeah, we can. Hang on a second. Um, firstly, really good report. Really enjoyed reading it. Lots of really informative stuff. And I particularly like the focus on talent, especially STEM. Do you take the position that the, there should be a second man in there, which is management? Okay, so maybe hold that thought and I'll take a couple of questions together. So let's have another one. The lady at the front. <coughs> But, so Jessica Brown from Meta, thanks for the shout out for the Bible six report. <laughs> yeah. um, my question is again about skills, which is why I set my hands up, because as someone with a master's in physics, I would never be the right person to take on the technical content of one of these companies, because I may be able to do things in labs, but I certainly can't do anything with a computer. Um, and I think sometimes this mismatch between what we're teaching at university and what we seem to be encouraging with the government policy at the moment around STEM education are not the skills, in fact very, very far, almost in opposition to the skills we're asking for in these companies. And so I'd just like to understand a little bit more when we talk about, and in your recommendations talk about, more STEM graduates, yeah. how you think that relates to the kind of skills we're looking for today. Okay, and anyone else wants to weigh in on STEM and skills? Okay, so uh, Nick. Hello, uh, Simon from Tech City News. Uh, question. Uh, as you say, 20 years ago, everybody was using Acorn computers in the classroom, uh, etc. Now, what went wrong? Why are we now back in the same position? Okay, and uh, Nick, next to you. Thanks, Nick Penster from Cisco. Um, really good discussion, excellent report, Chris. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions on skills, and so let, let me start off with you if I can. Um, we all agree the importance of skills, and Joe, I thought your comments were right on the money. In, in, in a couple of ways. But one word I haven't heard in the context of skills is apprenticeships. Now, it's one thing that the government's doing very well. And Sam, the question for you really is, you've had a <coughs> tough call from Joe to go back to the Prime Minister and say you think you should uh, charge your university graduates 100 grand. But the serious question is, what do you think about Ed Miliband's technical baccalaureate? If we're being non-partisan non in this, it seems to us as employers by the way, just as you do the outreach for, for Skill CLB, uh, that this is an interesting idea. So on the one hand, we're all signed up to say we want more science graduates, but most definitely for STEM the capability in the country. But there's an interesting idea that emerging from, from the Labour Party around the technical tackle uh, around. And equally, no one's mentioned today UTCs, which again, we think you, you mentioned 14 and 18. We think this is a, a really good initiative. And again, if your government, is your idea, if you could just put more oomph behind it, because I don't think we should be trying to just import skills for today, as you said, because we have to take a long time to get this. Okay, thank you. So, um, a range of questions on um, skills, particularly around the focus on STEM, and should that be just STEM or broader into management, into design, and so on, and questions about apprenticeships and about UTCs. Maybe Sam, I'll let you uh, take some of this first and then if anyone else wants to chip in, they can. Great, thanks. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, on the management side, I think one of the policies that I've found interesting is to be an entrepreneur and move to the UK to start a business, I think you needed 200,000 pounds. And last year, the government changed that to 50,000 pounds. And I think it's things like that that should help attract people who have got not just investment, but some of the management capability to start and grow businesses. But you're right to say when we look at skills, it's not just the people you employ within the business, it is being able to bring management from abroad or wherever in the world to um, work in businesses in the UK. Where I have a slight issue though is I mean I think we're right to focus on STEM subjects. We should encourage more people to take them and Michael Goose EBAC is really around the core skills you need. But we've got to sort of going outside of this room, not everyone in the world is going to be a Java developer. Not everyone in the world is skilled that way, not everyone in the world is talented or has that as an interest. What education has to be is it's got to be appropriate to the individual concerned, while at the same time making sure that what they are studying is actually stimulating them enough and interesting enough. So I wouldn't really say that you should uh, charge 
um, humanities graduates a little more than engineering graduates. I think you need an education system that is appropriate for the individuals, because in terms of our life, there's a lot that enriches all of us uh, beyond um, what you know is productive for the digital <coughs> sector. So that's my answer to your point about the technical baccalaureate. That said, you know when we talk about appropriate education, I think it's right that we've really pushed apprentices. I think there's much more we can do because we've had the system and quite rightly championed university education. We have more and more people going to university now than they did 20, 30 years ago. But we should also accept that for other people, there may be other routes into the workplace that they may want to explore and to take. And it's good that we've got lots of people, more and more people taking apprenticeships. But we also think what we need to do is really raise the value of apprenticeship so that when you decide that's what you're going to do and you know you might end up sort of working in you know a startup and doing amazing well you don't think that's the second class option that you're taking that it is as valuable as taking a degree and that's one something that Germany has done very well Germany have a lot of technical courses and if you take a technical course and you come out of it it is as valued as um, going to university um, is uh, concerned in terms of the university courses and the links, you know, so you've done physics and how do you make sure that's, that's um, exactly what is needed for the workplace. Again, I think what we need to develop more of is the links between universities and the world of work. And just to take the gem, I mean, one of the things the Germans have is the Fraunhofer's where, you know, you've got partnership between universities, investors and businesses. And so uh, research projects that people are pursuing are exactly the sort of projects that something could be commercialised and also that investors are willing to back. And I think more links between universities and uh, business is the way to achieve that. And we've got great examples um, in the UK. Aston University has got some good examples. Warwick has got um, some good examples of that. And I think we need to see more of that so that the degree course you're taking actually easily uh, provides you with transferable skills. Okay. So I, I would stick with that not everyone's going to be a job developer. There's no question about that. Um, <laughs> however, we should be able to find out who has the aptitude and interest in becoming a job developer a lot earlier than we did. So um, if you look at the national curriculum, when we started out Dev Camp, I ended up talking to a lot of people involved in, in um, technology and education and found out that in the national curriculum in Key Stage 2, the ICT curriculum is to learn PowerPoint. And I think no matter what political persuasion you are, we can all agree the last thing the world needs is another PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> um, and, you know, my children who are of uh, that age in Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2, and now into secondary school are coming home and telling me what they're learning in their ICT classes. And it's shocking, frankly. And so when you peel back the onion and you try to figure out why kids are getting taught Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, you find out it's because most of the instructors know that and don't know and aren't comfortable with or are somewhat intimidated by anything more advanced than that. And so the you know the programs like Apps for Good I think is an interesting one which is going in and try to teach ICT teachers um, uh, some more advanced uh, programming languages, even JavaScript, some other things that, that they can they can introduce in their classes. Um, that is a uneven and um, not institutionalized program in any way, shape, or form. And so to start to introduce some of those um, ideas sooner, even things like Code Academy, where you can go online and learn JavaScript. I mean, my 11-year-old is doing this right now, learning JavaScript, you know, an online course in Code Academy. And it's certainly helping her in her mathematics skills and being able to develop compartmentalized thinking, even if she never becomes a developer. Um, and so I think these are the areas that, that government can have an impact. Um, they may not be as sexy. And they may take longer than, than others, which you know you can claim credit for. But I think they're the things that will have a, a long-term positive impact. Okay. I'm going to take a few more questions from the floor because I know a lot of people wanted to ask. So I'm just uh, coming on that as well. Though, okay, very, very quickly. Just on the point on the the Acorn computer, I think uh, what, why did that just disappear? That sense in which you, everyone learned to code. And I think it's kind of like a victim of our own success in that. Uh, user operating systems, like the way in which you use a computer, you used to have to actually kind of set it up to start going, in which case kind of coding was just part of the way in which you used a computer. And gradually it's just, you just switch it on, and now the ease with which you do stuff has become so, um, so kind of automatic that the idea that there's coding behind it seemed far away. And, and over time, kind of that's just meant that, that, that people have felt, well, I don't need to learn this, in the same way that 
Our cars have become more sophisticated. We don't need to know how the electronics of a car works. Um, but you're still going to need someone to repair the car. And you're still going to need them. And with computing, I think it's, it's even more important. On the, on the physics and STEM point, I would just say that um, we have a lot of computer science uh, graduates as our engineers, but we have a lot of people who are, who've done physics and have done maths. And learning coding is not the difficult thing. Learning the, the way of thinking that you do through doing STEM, mm -hmm. you're much more adaptable to learning coding. Um, so I think that that's why that's really valuable. So you might get a job at Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for your work. Okay. So um, let's take a few more questions. So the gentleman uh, up there. And we'll take three and, and bundle them together. So. Thank you. John Singer from Global Consultants. Um, we hear a lot about the different environment in the US, in uh, Silicon Valley, um, and how it differs to the environment in the UK. It's a, a refrain that we hear over and over again. Can the panel just comment on why, if the US model is so successful, do more countries not just copy it? Okay, and uh, down the front, Mike friends on its way. It was just two really quick comments, actually. Wait, I think just, uh, have your name and where you're from. Sorry, I'm Harry Metcalf from, from DXW and also the Open Rights Group. Um, <coughs> lost, my, lost my train of thought. Uh, one of the things I think government could do, actually, with respect to secondary school education, which I agree is scandalous, uh, is to change the curriculum. Um, I mean, there's certainly more teachers can do, uh, but they're in a position of having to train their students to pass their exams, and a GCSE in IT is basically a GCSE in office, and that's what needs to change. Um, on the uh, point about computers being much easier, I actually think that's slightly illusory. I mean, I see people doing things in spreadsheets, labouring over them for whole days, stuff that I could do in 20 minutes with a quick script. <laughs> I think part, part of the problem is that people don't realise how much you can do with just a little bit of code. So uh, I don't think everybody needs to learn to be a developer, but I do think basic coding is a part of basic technological literacy. OK, let's take one more. So uh, I'll jump on that. Pass the mic along. Yes, um, David Newman, and uh, several people mentioned fear of failure as a reason why you might not start up as an entrepreneur. Now, I was at a meeting at the Halo Business Angels Network in Northern Ireland, and even with their picked out entre groups of entrepreneurs, Five out of ten are going to fail in the first year. Five or six of them. Four will just turn over and one make it big. So I was wondering if you thought of any policy initiatives that might reduce the fear of failure. For example, increasing welfare benefits for entrepreneurs and their employees who fail, because it's quite hard to get them when you're self-employed. Maybe even no means test first, or no, maybe a business case for George Osborne announcing in the next budget an increase in welfare benefits. But you may have other ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so three interesting questions. One, um, why, why isn't every country in the world just copying uh, California? Um, a point around uh, a little bit of code goes a long way. Um, and some questions in there about the curriculum and um, how do we uh, help people get over this fear of failure? Um, Simon, can I start with Well, you? I'm happy to take the California point. Yeah, go for it. Because I think it's terrible policy to try to imitate somebody else's success. First of all, it doesn't work. Um, just talk to the talk to the French when they tried to build Sophie and people this as the uh, Silicon Valley of France, complete catastrophe. But if, apart from the fact that it doesn't work, it, it's a sign of, of emotional cowardice. Uh, the policies that work are the work, ones that work with the grain, the ones that work on the basis of building on the what you have already that works and being able to extend that. And you start by thinking about as Chris, you did very well in, in, in the report. What is it that we do well here? What is it that suits us? And where's the world going? And play to that strength. Mm -hmm. On the Silicon Valley question, I mean, I, I think it's the silliest question in the world. Sorry to, if, it's, uh, if it's rude to you, but I hear it all the time. And um, you know, if you think about Detroit as the center of manufacturing of automobiles, it's, there's a great analog there, right? Because you have all these industries grow around Detroit, and advertising agencies built big offices around Detroit, and there's a whole ecosystem that was created around Detroit. <coughs> but cars get produced all over the world today. So Silicon Valley is a seed pod that has exploded and will germinate the entire planet. And this is happening in London, it's happening in Brazil, it's happening in Korea, and it's happening everywhere. 
Now, they started before us in Silicon Valley because 100 years ago, they had you know, someone who endowed Stanford University and Hewlett Packard got started there and there was an ecosystem that got built very early on, so they're way ahead of the game. The other thing that we should not forget is that you know, America leads the world in self-esteem. It doesn't always have a lot behind it. But, um, so let, let's not, you know, again, let's go back to what, are, what can we do, what are we good at, but Silicon Valley is a global initiative. Can I just, sorry, to just pick up a short point because it's a great point. The real danger for Valley today is the danger of monoculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the real strengths here is the mashup, is so the idea of being able to, but, but, but it's all they do. Right, and, and that's a very dangerous place to be as a local economy. The great thing here is that you have hybrids. Hybrids are strong. I'll take the, I'll take the fear of uh, failure point. I think one of, the, one of the things is cultural, and there are a number of people who, when they think of starting a business, immediately think their home is going to be on the line, and they don't want their home to be on the line, so therefore it's not going to start it. But as I mentioned, actually for a little startups, all you need is equity investment and to try and raise up in friends and family rather than go to a bank and uh, get pre loan security. But the way to combat it, I think, is around making it easy for people to start. The easier it is for people to start a business, the more people are likely to try. And that's why it's important, you know, in terms of raising capital, you know, getting um, mentorship, all of those things. If you make it easier, more people are going to start. But then it is a fact that if you start something new, that hasn't been tried before, generally the failure rate is a lot higher than doing repeating something that's been done successfully. But the way to combat that, I mean, we need a cultural shift. In America, if something fails, it's put down to experience. Um, in Europe, if you fail, it's, well, that's, that's really bad, don't try it again. And then we just need to, and the way to combat that, I think, is to celebrate success. If you celebrate success and celebrate people who do well, there are going to be more people who are going to keep trying. A lot of people will enter the X Factor, we know who will win it. <laughs> but everybody tries because the success is celebrated so much. And I think we've got to get away from the culture where we actually bash people who have been successful and wealth creators and actually celebrate some of that success. And I think once you do that, people will be more willing to try. And Ronald Cohen, who founded um, Apex, which is one of the um, first venture capital firms in the UK said, a field entrepreneur is only the entrepreneur who stops trying. And even for a lot of those who are successful, they would have been through a lot of cycles of not every venture works, try new ones, etc. That's the nature of entrepreneurship. On, on Silicon Valley, I, I don't know if anyone's been there, but uh, we really don't want London to be like Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is so boring. It's, yeah, absolutely. it's just like, there. It's just, I mean, San Francisco, fantastic, but Silicon Valley is outside San Francisco. It's just a road with a lot of big businesses, and there's interesting stuff going on inside those businesses, but outside is Taco Bell, and, and that's it, pretty much. <laughs> and and it, it, is, it is monochrome, it's boring, and uh, London and places like this, you know, they, we have this fantastic creative industry in the UK. We have a financial center, we have a fashion industry, all on each other's doorstep, and what's different about Shoreditch, about this part of town, is it's, it's where all those things come together. And I think the kind of technology and the kind of innovations that will come through in this building and, and in other places around this, this part of London will be completely different takes on what Silicon Valley would have done, because they have a different mentality, a different understanding, um, and I think that's a good thing. But I, I, I totally agree with Sarah that, that one of the things that we could borrow from America is this culture of um, of not treating uh, failure, uh, not treating a business going going down uh, as a sign of failure. I mean, it's, investors look for it to see whether you've got the experience in the US. You know, how many companies have you run, run into the ground before they're going to invest in a company that's going to succeed? And in the UK, you know, the, the Americans have chapter 11. When you go into, when, when your business collapses, there's, there's, a, there's a way in which you grow, can grow it back out again. In the UK, you go into bankruptcy. If you're bankrupt, you can't become an MP. If you're, you know, bankruptcy is where all these Charles Dickens stories are about people being put in prison. And there's a kind of mentality in, in, in Britain that failure is failing a business is a terrible thing to have done. Uh, whereas in the U.S., you know, the kind of high school, you know, the, the, the graduates from universities kind of go around with badges, kind of saying, you know, how many how many companies they've had and failed by the time they're 25. And there is a cultural shift we need, uh, but that's very difficult to do. Yeah, I mean, let's go back to the point I made earlier. It's about 
providing people with confidence that we can do it actually um, and and also kind of raising their their visibility because you know the the, the network and the cluster thing is so important because you know the, the best way and the best kind of antidote is if you can talk to someone who has failed or or succeeded you know when you're at that point where you you think i, I might be failing then actually it can take a lot of the pain out of it and, and you feel less isolated because i think someone made the point earlier about you know entrepreneurs often feeling very lonely and I, I, th I think that's something that's easy to be underestimated so that power of networks and just being able to bounce ideas off people and why you know, genuinely places like this are really important okay well, let's take a look okay. on the, on that yeah. one. Um, so for the last six and a half years i've failed every day <laughs> right i feel like i fail every day and if you're afraid of failure you shouldn't start a business now i think it's not for everyone right and so just don't do it okay so um let's take another three questions so happily <coughs> get the microphone over Thanks. I'm Hadley Beeman from LinkedGov, which is a startup here, and also from Government's Technology Strategy Board. Um, and I just wanted to make two quick points, um, one of which is I've, I've lived in Silicon Valley, I'm half American, um, and it's important to remember that we have a number of advantages here that they do not have. Um, we have a much more integrated uh, developer community, never mind the other industries that you were talking about. In Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, um, all of the, the meetups and the tech-related events are, are stratified to the point of being just for Python developers or just for JavaScript or, or whatever. Um, and there's very little cross-pollination. We have bar camps here and we have um, you know, weekend hackathon events that are bringing everyone together, um, which make it much easier to form teams, much easier to find out what else is available, what we can build, and then uh, ultimately much easier to create businesses when the time comes to <coughs> put together a, a team for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention on the subject of um, combining uh, universities and um, the workforce and businesses, um, Government's Technology Strategy Board is funding the Open Data Institute and the catalog, or, sorry, Catapult Centers, um, both of which are, are launching reasonably soon, um, who will be R&D um, uh, sort of centers of activity in those areas. And they should be uh, very much pulling together relevant research activities and hopefully training activities within the universities and connecting them specifically with business needs. Um, so that should help uh, direct the, I don't know, the curriculum, but, but certainly the workforce as well. Okay, thank you. So uh, these two ladies at uh, the front. Hi, I'm Amy Gray from the Government Affairs team at Tesco. Um, I was just reflecting on how you know Tesco has gone from being one market stall in Hackney 90 years ago to being the UK's biggest retailer and the third largest in the world. And, and reflecting the way that we've done that is really always thinking about our customer, anticipating what they want and, and giving them what they want and what they need. And um, you didn't really talk very much about sort of customers and end users um, for, for entrepreneurs. So who, who are the customers of, of you know all these great entrepreneurs? Here and what is it that those customers really, really want? So maybe just kind of thinking, sort of a few decades ahead into the future, where where are we going to be? Where are you guys going to take us? Okay, great question. Thank you. Let's take one more. Hello, um, I'm Natalie Gavo. I've actually created a, a company here called Sharpgate, uh, and it's my first, my second company. My first one was in France, uh, called Price Minister, and uh, and uh, I can uh, yeah say that here, a starting company here is I think great. Uh, it's a great place. Uh, the first, my, my first question was, if Price Minister uh, became successful, I mean, it took 10 years. But, uh, the first years where we had a lot of interns in the company. And uh, obviously this is a fantastic deal for a young company because uh, these people, they work very hard, they really are. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think we wouldn't necessarily have succeeded without these uh, interns that they also got a great experience out of Price Minister. So I'm obviously trying for Shark to recruit people to do the same thing. I, I find that here, um, yeah, I'm really interested in, in these type of schemes. Um, and the second thing is obviously the emergency for us is mobile and data. Uh, and these are very specific areas uh, which are where innovation is very, very fast at the moment. And um, I'm meeting a lot of developers and recruiting talent here. And I'm wondering if in the, in the current policy there are specific uh, things that can be done you know, to accelerate that because we can't wait for the next generation of developers. This is really about getting people now that are able to develop what we want to develop from a product perspective. 
And uh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to outsource that necessarily because this is core to building, you know, a successful uh, shopping platform on the web. Okay, thank you. So, um, so an interesting point around um, the role of government and the ODI and technology strategy board and others. Um, a question about who are the consumers of all of these fantastic um, high-tech startups and digital businesses? What about um, internships and um, this question around um, the role of data and mobile in particular? So, um, well, I'm happy to pick up on mobile and data. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so we sold a company last year, um, hundred million dollar exits, public record. Um, young company making. Uh, mobile social applications and the reason the buyer came and paid us a lot of money um, for a business that was still very young was because of the people. I mean, yes, we had some revenues, yes, we had some good clients, but it was really the talent. The ta that talent is very scarce um, and valued. Uh, if we can, I mean, again, I'm going to come back to the, the work Joe was talking about before. If we can create ways of training people up on how do you develop in the mobile world, how do you develop in a data-constrained world, uh, we will be able to create more and better companies as a result. Uh, by the way, we ought to talk about Pigeon at some point, <laughs> but that's a different I'm discussion. Okay. Um, on customers, uh, gosh, you know, when I'm not sitting here on, on a panel, <coughs> we're sweating customers all the time. Um, you know, we are, I mean, uh, everyone in my company, it's, their bonus is tied to customer satisfaction. <coughs> Right? It's the one metric that everyone's bonus in the company is tied to. And you know, we're in an industry where customer satisfaction has traditionally been very low, and the bar is very low, and we've focused on really trying to set ourselves apart by increasing customer <coughs> satisfaction, and that's been kind of the focus from day one of what we do. We had you know, folks, myself, my team out in the rain, Monday night at Radiohead, standing outside the O2 talking to customers. We're always out talking to customers. I, my Twitter account and email account is available to my customers all the time. I talk to them every day in that way when I'm not talking to them face to face. So um, I probably spend more time talking to customers than I do my team. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a healthy way to do it or not. But um, you know, it's the one thing, I think consumer businesses, uh, the only way that they're a business is if you solve a problem for customers. And so we just have to keep solving problems. There's plenty of them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look, for me, customers, you know, the, the, um, being an exchange in the market, you know, I, I often view as being at the centre of, of you know, and it's trendy to kind of talk about ecosystems and clusters, but, you know, that, that's what we do. <coughs> um, so, you know, my customers are so varied from, you know, the users of capital to savers to, you know, all the intermediaries, and, and you know, it's really important that we continue to build that customer base and that we've got each of those components. Because, you know, I mean, we, we had a conversation about Silicon Valley earlier on, um, and this is not kind of gratuitous London Stock Exchange versus NASDAQ conversation, but, you know, what we do have in the UK is that network of, <coughs> of customers that, that actually will support growth and smaller businesses where you know, things have moved so upmarket in the US and in many other global exchanges that you know, they, they just don't focus on, on smaller companies and their needs. <coughs> um, just a quick one on the customer's point. And there's a, a probably apocryphal a newspaper article that um, came out several years ago when Tim Berners-Lee said the internet was going to change billions of lives. And I've got it here, and what it says is computer web to change billions of lives, in brackets, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and then he goes on to say in the article, you know, they said Sinclair C5 would change the world, now you would struggle to give one away. So the first point I'm making about customers is, I think the, the internet is transformative in how it's operating and changing all our lives already, but the businesses that succeed within that are the businesses that actually have a clear proposition to address the problem. One of the things about the internet is, while we discussed very early on that it's relatively easier to start a business on the internet, is also quite quickly you realize whether or not you've got a proposition that anyone is going to use. So to answer your question, those that are successful will be the ones that actually have a, are addressing a problem and are servicing the customers in the right way. Obviously, what's been coming up time and time again is this issue of skills and where you get them from. And on the interns point, I think one of the points that Prime Minister made in his speech yesterday around work experience is that encouraging people, young people to do work experience isn't Dickensian, isn't sending them <coughs> up the chimneys, actually helping them. And I think that's something that we've got to realize. I 
did a number of internships before I got my full-time job. Some of them were paid, some of them were unpaid. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that internships should be unpaid, but getting a career and building a career is a question of sort of steps, and work experience and internships are critical components in those steps, and we should encourage people to do them. Yeah, it's not bad uh, I don't really want to lecture Tesco on. <laughs> <laughs> like you guys know better than anyone about um, consumers. Um, and uh, but one thing I would say that, that, that about the businesses here, like you can be a two-man business here, and your market today is um, is two billion people online, and within the next five years it'll be five billion people online. It's very hard to know what all those consumers want. And that's part of the challenge. And you guys do a lot of data, and data is going to become really important in helping people understand uh, what their consumers want, and where they're doing well and where they're doing badly. Um, and we need to get better at that across the board. Uh, and that goes back to the point that someone was saying that you know, should we be training people to do coding, or do we need to train people to do management as well? One of the key areas where we need uh, smarter people, you know, you'll, you'll have this uh, throughout your staff as well is that you know, the jobs that 20 years ago didn't seem to need any aspect of you know, uh, understanding data are now going to be increasingly about data. You know, what, what's the most effective place in the store to put your products? And what's the most effective uh, way to set up your uh, your shifts for your for your workers? More and more of that is going to be told to you by data, and, and that will change the consumer experience. From Google's perspective, I think there's an interesting thing about our lives are becoming slightly more complicated in the way that we, uh, we use so much stuff online now. I mean, I find myself, I'm sometimes just trying to kind of get something from here to over there and be able to work out where did I put that thing that was, I end up kind of having to just kind of become my own search engine of, of all the stuff I've got in different places. Um, and I think, how do you make people's lives easier? Um, how do you build products that are making their lives easier, not like another thing that they've got to work out Remember the password for do that thing. Do that in loyalty code. Yeah, and it's kind of like, I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's a simplicity of that process. And it, it, it's all going to be about how do you give people more time to do the things where they don't want computers in their lives. Like the things that are really good fun that you, you don't need a computer for. But how, do you, how do computers help you get more time to do those things? The only thing I add is how, what, one of the things I'm surprised with the number of internet businesses that actually have very strong customer services sitting mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. So as a user, you just see the nice website and it works for you, etc. But there are a lot of successful ones that actually are underpinned by yeah. proper people offering yeah. customer service in the way that we traditionally understand it. That's a critical part of their success. We almost have to overcompensate in a way. Right? So we opened up a shop uh, next to the O2 at North Greenwich earlier this year for people to collect tickets on the way into the O2. And we could have done just anything, but we actually kitted it out like a nice pub because we wanted people to understand that we weren't just a bunch of computers, that there were people with a sensibility behind the business who had a sensibility to think about, well, what should that entertainment experience be in the start of your entertainment experience? But we really couldn't communicate it through the website because a lot of our customers said, oh, you're just a bunch of computers. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, one last question and give the panel a chance to respond to that and then make any closing comments. So, John, I know you can make more time to Make a point in the third uh, John Burt, House of Lords, and wearing a number of other hats, including Chairman of PayPal Europe. Um, it's clear from your report, Chris, and the panel discussion that there is an enormous amount here to celebrate. There's, uh, the cup is three quarters full, and there's a fair amount of consensus to think about the ways in which the cup is not totally full, and an important one is skills. And I think it is worth saying that skills is a huge strategic problem for the UK economy and it has been for decades. And the underlying issue is that whilst we all of us must be free if we wish to study ancient Greek, um, at the other end the education system has to be very much more sensitive than it has been historically to the myriad of skills that the UK economy needs. And it's not just things that Natalie mentioned, massive shortage of mobile data. It's in every area. I'm involved in many different British institutions. <coughs> they are kept alive by foreign skills. And actually, this government is shooting itself in the foot by 
denying access to the vital skills that the British economy needs, which it is not supplying at many, many different kinds of levels, not just technological, but other kinds of high finance skills and so on and, and, and so forth. So I actually applaud the direction of travel of this uh, government um, in, in moving more towards a baccalaureate, but frankly, it's got at a very, very high level. We've simply got to find ways of incentivizing the education system and those who study <coughs> to study things that the real economy will need when they, uh, when they graduate. And the second observation, um, and I'm very conscious of this having been involved in, in PayPal since the beginning uh, in Europe, is that um, yes, the capital markets work a lot better in the UK. Indeed, they work brilliantly at a very high level. We're one of the most important financial centers in the whole world. Uh, and they work pretty well at this level, but I question whether they work well enough. Um, and one obvious thing to say is that the US economy is eight times bigger than the UK economy. And Europe cannot be proud, and the UK cannot be proud, in having produced really big um, uh, uh, digital-based um, businesses. And one of the reasons for that is that if you create a expensive technology platform in the US, whether it's called Google or whether it's called eBay, the marginal incremental cost to roll out that program to the rest of the world is, is, is tiny. And frankly, the UK and Europe will not produce major businesses until the capital markets work in such a way as to fund entry into the United States. And so I think it would be useful to hear the panels, and indeed your views, because you've studied the market, that however well they work, and I readily acknowledge they work pretty well, what, we, what do we have to do to make them work even better? Okay, thank you. So um, I'll ask the panel to tackle those questions and also give us any uh, closing remarks as we head towards the end of this. Maybe I'll start with Marcus. Just starting with your second point about the capital markets. Well, I do think that things you know, could be improved, and you know, we've certainly recommended a package of measures, some of which are regulatory, some of which are tax-based, uh, that we talked about today. Um, but I, I do also think that there are some real perception issues. So you know, the point about you know, the US capital markets <coughs> supporting businesses to a greater extent than the UK or the European capital markets can is right on some levels. And for the, the very largest companies with the highest growth rates, that may well be right. But I think for the vast majority of companies, that's simply not the case. So you know. Without sort of boring you with too much technical detail, you know, we, we've done a lot of analysis of this because it's clearly really important to our business model. And you know what you actually find is a lot of businesses that float tech businesses in the U.S. tend to do pretty well at the time of you know, flotation and valuation, but actually the aftermarket performance is not that good because you know, they, they end up having to compete against domestic businesses where the investors can go and kick the tires very readily. Um, and so you know, what we need to do is make sure that companies you know, list, prim you know, European companies list in their own time zone and build a very strong core of local investors. You, know, you can still access all of those US investors, or the majority of them, through a European, you know, in our case, a London listing. <coughs> I think a lot of companies you know, just don't, don't get that. So, you know, a number of us have been at round tables at number 10 discussing exactly this point. And my concern about some of those conversations was, you know, the starting point was just, we can't do it in London. Well, it's not right. You know, so what we're doing and the announcement um, that we made at, at Seed Camp a couple of weeks ago was about reducing the, some of the entry criteria, so the level of free float, so that you know, businesses can come and float less of their business, give up less of their control, but start at an earlier stage to build that relationship with their investor community so that they're not forced to sell a massive chunk of the business at the time of IPO and then possibly get encouraged to seek too high a valuation, etc. etc. So you know, there are some very tangible things that we're doing to rectify the situation. And even in the last couple of weeks, 
you know, a number of companies in our pipeline have said, you know, just that change in itself will make a material difference to whether we consider the London, the UK, the European capital markets versus the US. So, you know, we've got things in train. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on your point about scaling, um, the challenge is how, you know, this is a population of 60 million, you've got a population of 300 million. Um, it's not just true of financing, it's the true of the, for an internet company, it's true of the cost of the engineering. But the, the big challenge that Google faces is not in designing a really neat piece of software or a great new algorithm. How do you make that work for two billion people or 100 million people at any one time? And if you're designing a great product here, and it's, and, and it's everyone in the UK who's online uses it, what, 40 million people, you're still a drop in the ocean in terms of a global scale. So you, how do you build at that global level is, a, is an engineering feat as well. Um, in terms of the kind of the, the things that I've learned today, Simon vehemently disagrees with me. Um, <laughs> Joe has got the most provocative idea for stimulating discussion around skills that I've ever heard, um, which I think is great. And um, uh, but for me, I could, the, the one key issue that keeps coming back is this issue around you know it's a long-term challenge, but we need to change what we're doing in schools. The, the government have already said they're going to scrap the uh, computing uh, curriculum as it stands in school and rebuild it. Um, that's not going to happen until 2014 probably. But I think even between now and then, we need to think both as private sector companies and as the government about what are we going to do to be ready, um, and particularly when we can't bring in that time from abroad. Okay. Um. Yeah, and just first on the issue of capital, I mean, I agree that everything has been said on sort of capital markets and semi scaling. The only point I'll add to the issue of capital is on the institutional side, and especially the venture capital market. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think the, the venture capital market in the UK is as big and thriving as it is in the US, and that's before you go to the capital markets. So eBay was funded mainly through venture capital money, and Facebook, before its IPO, raised something like two, three hundred million, if not more, from venture capital funds. And I think look, that's why I think looking at the structure in terms of debt, equity, and how those are treated is important, so we can unlock cash <coughs> into that. That, that space. Um, the only the final uh, comment I'll make is um, in listening mode. It's very clear where um, people are on the issue of skills and what more that more needs to be done. And I'll definitely uh, communicate that back. So thank you. Okay. Any final thoughts from you? Well, the capital markets question. Um, I think that you know London largely is sitting on the sidelines in capital markets when it comes to tech companies. So on the on the sell side, the bulge bracket banks don't even have any banks <coughs> in London. Uh, if you talk to people on the buy side, they actually have a hard time following the conversation talking about companies. Right? They don't get the technology. They don't actually get what you're talking about. So right now, London is on the sidelines of tech when it comes to capital markets and public markets. And I know you guys are doing a lot, but in the larger picture, um, London's not the game. Uh, if that changed or not, I don't know. But you know, you have to kind of think about like underlying that. Why has London chosen to step out of it? Was it they got their fingers burned in 2000 and they're staying away? I, I don't really know the answer to that. And, and so peeling back that onion to find out is going to be the next step to try to make a change there. Um, in terms of scaling, question. You know, in addition to the U.S., I mean, there's something in the U.S. called the Interstate Commerce Clause, which means that if your business is legal in one state, it's legal in 50 states, and you get the people. My business in the UK alone is subject to oversight from 17 different bodies that I'm aware of that have contacted me um, on a regular basis. We've had uh, seven different DCMS parliamentary inquiries, OFT uh, reviews to see whether there should be greater regulatory um, oversight or outright or outright outlaw of the business that I operate over the last six years we've operated. So it's at least one a year that we've spent more time doing that than talking to our customers or doing the other things that we should do to develop skills. So it's like the governor wants to put me out of business. Put me out of business already, right? Like just don't keep me hanging. Uh, so and then you multiply that times the ten company ten countries in Western Europe that we operate where the European Union doesn't exist from a regulatory standpoint because there's a different regulatory regime in every single one of those places <coughs> that we operate. So we get no benefit to scale when we think about <coughs> regulatory regime. But you know what, I can whine and complain all day long. Um, the reality is that you know we've got 
free flow of capital, we've got a great time zone, we have democratic institutions, we've got an incredibly uh, intelligent and outwardly focused society here, and a lot of people come together and have this discussion and debate, and so, you know, tomorrow morning I'm getting back up and I'm going back to work to do what we do. <laughs> Well, I can't really beat that. Um, <laughs> but I would push the single European point hard. I mean, the UK did a great job pushing the Single European Act many years ago and actually making the European Union a free trade union where you can build a company here and trade across all, all the countries in the Union would be a huge step and we're a long way away. And this is something that is pro European but also worth fighting for. Um, on the classicist point, actually, some of the best programs I've ever known were classicists. You know, there's, there's, there is a certain rigor in that discipline. What we need is the ability to then help them make that transition. Is just in time training is what we need. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And I would, um, for what it's worth, underline the point around skills. I think you're right that it's one of the big strategic challenges that we face. Um, and the main insight from our report is that um, yes, we have to equip our kids to um, have the right skills for the future economy. It is about STEM, but it's also about um, some of the broader disciplines, it's about creativity, it's about great design, great communication. Um, and that doesn't have to be an either-or question um, with skilled migration either, actually. You can find a way through which, uh, which hits both of those. So on that point, um, I'm going to draw this to a close. If you haven't um, seen a copy of the report, then I'd encourage you to um, get hold of it from the Policy Exchange website. Um, I'd love to hear what you think, so if after reading it you've got thoughts or reactions, then please drop me an email send me a message on Twitter or um, you know, put it onto paper. Um, but for now, thank you all for coming, and I'd like to uh, ask you to thank, uh, join me in thanking the uh, 